political leaders in the Republic of Cameroon continue questioning the feasibility of government's reconstruction plan in the northwest and southwest regions of the Republic of Cameroon, hit by socio political and security tensions for close to four years today. And they are asking how the reconstruction will go on in the midst of gun battles between separatists and um, government forces and we'll be hearing one of the political leaders in this edition of the 6 p.m. newscast on Equinox Television. Three persons have died in a road accident in the west region of Cameroon. Stay with us. Highways in the Republic of Cameroon continue recording uh, deaths in accidents. The last accident in the west region of the country left at least three persons dead in the locality of uh, Fumbot. You know, send us the first in details. Division of the West Region. <laughs> A road accident claims the lives of three women and injuring dozens. They were on board this vehicle severely damaged after driver lost control of it. The victims were returning from a wedding. Sources say the driver returns to the ceremonial ground to take home the groom's bride. Unfortunately, the happy moment transformed to a nightmare. Victims are receiving treatment in a hospital where they were transported. It should be recalled, two died on the scene Monday, while the third gave up the ghost in the hospital early Tuesday. You know, soon as they're reporting there, the decision of the Cameroon Airlines Corporation, Cameco, to send uh, 250 workers to uh, techni on technical leave is attracting huge criticisms from civil aviation experts. And according to an expert, the decision is a desperate move from a failing public company. For me, I'm strong Sander reports. The decision of the Cameroon Airline Company, Cameco, to lay off over 250 workers to save head and cover face amid COVID-19 is seen by an aeronautic expert as another confused move from a public company that has consistently failed throughout its existence. Cameco has always been losing money. Cameco has been on, on life support from the world go when it started. The government has had good intentions and has always put in money. But the money has not been put to good use. Nobody, or at least I haven't seen the document, can account for how much money the government has put in and how that money has been spent. You take, for example, the workers have always been paid, not from the resources of the company, but by government subvention. The fuel has been taken on credit. Mr. David Sinati says the main problem with Cameco is poor management stemming from the top bottom incompetence of its staff. It has been managed by people who are not competent. They have managed people who themselves are not competent. And here I'm not mincing my word. I'm talking in terms of incompetence from the general managers, the board of directors. There hasn't been any competence in it at all. The expert believes that laying up workers is not the most important decision at this moment. There are other far more important decisions and uh, far more direction to go than simply putting a certain number of people on the technical leave. For example, they talk of it being renewable in, in the next three months. In the next three months, what is going to happen? Not as if three months is, will not arrive. It will arrive. But are there anything being put in place to make sure that in that three months something would have changed? To revamp the public structure, the pride of Cameroon, Mr. Arte Davison says Cameroon must go back to the basics. We need an international company of reputation, kind of babysit the new Cameroon air company. They take in the people that they want to take from Cameroon, 
who are qualified, who are interested, who are enthusiastic, who are passionate, and they define what their program is. Kameko, in the documents published June the 22nd, 2020, says the objective is to avoid accumulating salary-related debts for a company which sees operations since April 2020, and also to limit the spread of COVID-19 among staff. How can reconstruction go on while bullets are still crisscrossing the two regions, while gun battles between government forces and separatist fighters are still going on? How will the companies in charge of reconstruction and other persons move into uh, the destroyed parts of the two Anglophone regions of the country to carry on the reconstruction project? These are questions that opposition political leaders and civil society organizations are asking with regards to government's reconstruction plan in the northwest and southwest regions of the country it should be noted that the minister delegate at the Ministry of Economy, Planning and Regional Development, Paul Tassong, and the former mayor of Kumbunjong Donatos are leading um, a sensitization mission to the northwest region and southwest region of the uh, country within the framework of government's uh, reconstruction plan. They are in the northwest region meeting with administrative uh, council, uh, traditional, and all other stakeholders in view view of paving the way forward for the reconstruction of villages and other parts of the two Anglophone regions destroyed by the four-year-long war. Take a listen to the National Communication Secretary of the Popular Action Party who is raising concerns with regards to the feasibility of government's reconstruction plan. Good afternoon to everyone in the Northwest and Southwest. This is briefing on government reconstruction uh, plan of northwest and southwest we of the popular action party things once more this is another failed step taken by the government and we will not keep tolerating one failed step to another that is consuming the taxpayers income and the sweat of the Cameroonian people with no accountability, no balance sheet, and no concrete result. When we look at the 2017 Commission for the Promotion of Bilingualism and Multiculturalism, what has it yielded so far? What are the fruits of this commission? With huge budget allocated for it every year, the crisis is escalating more atrocities let's look at the national dialogue of 2018 what has he achieved so far with a huge budget of 12.7 billion that was allocated for it what accountability can be given for that income what achievements and today we are into reconstruction of northwest and southwest it's laughable. This is the height of it that Cameroonians can tolerate. Is it not the Ministry of Works that was confessing engineers in the Northwest and Southwest in a bid to construct roads are unable to do their job because of insecurity and chaos fights between the separatists and the uniform officers? That was Lena Fabrice, National Communication Secretary of the Popular Action Party, the PAP, raising concerns on the efforts put in by the Cameroon government to restore normalcy in the two Anglophone regions of the country and the reconstruction plan of the government of Cameroon in the two crises hit. Uh, regions and now we're taking you to Kiosi, which is a border town in the Cameroon and uh, Equatorial Guinea between along the border between Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea and inhabitants of uh, that part of Cameroon can now go about the activities 
hit free an attempt by equatorial uh, guinean the equator guinean government to construct a wall to block circulation was uh, said to have been uh, stopped by cameroonian authorities and inhabitants of the zone uh, were going through uh, several challenges because of that initiative by the equator guinean government to limit circulation between cameroon and that country smanji kangebre from a distance, one can spot the borders between Equatorial Guinea and Cameroon, which is now causing trouble that is almost destroying the relationship between the two Central African nations. It is not possible to go with a car, so we took a motorcycle. And after a 30 minutes ride, we arrived at the zone that is causing problem. Here, a road has been opened. It is on this port that it is alleged a wall of shame was about to be erected. Our first observation, the said wall hasn't been constructed. An image had gone viral saying the wall of shame has been erected which is not same with what we met on the field. Even though the wall hasn't been constructed, there were signs of it being done but for the intervention of the Cameroonian administration because the borderline between Equatorial Guinea and Cameroon were not respected. The inhabitants of this area have appreciated the government for their timely intervention because they can now go back to their farmland and continue with their work. They can now also move freely on this path, which wasn't the case three months ago. No, I feel no matter here. I've already worked here. I was staying out of bush. I work I produce I produce tomato, produce corn. Then I produce many things like like okra, vegetable I produce inside the bush mm. without problem. Mm. So I thank God how how they have already taken the place that that place and belong to Cameroon. So we are going to enjoy the place. The security forces we are told are also present in the zone supervising the area 24 and 24. The, military the soldiers who are on duty here ensure our security and we are happy for that. The decision that was taken by Malabo to construct a wall on its boundary with Cameroon continues to surprise Cameroonians since it gives no opportunity for the said regional integration Semak has been preaching. Recently, the President of the Republic, Paul Bia, received the Equatorial Guinean Minister in charge of integration because of this problem, after which top government officials also paid a visit to the zone. The inhabitants of QC say if the wall would have been constructed, it would have been a hindrance for their economic activities with persons from Equatorial Guinea. Now we take you to the Douala Seaport where economic operators are saying that several challenges are hampering the activities and causing enormous loss in income and of course they are indicating that the clearance procedures at the Douala Seaport are cumbersome and unfavorable. However, the Douala Seaport authorities say there is no such problem details in this report. Economic operators decry what they qualify as unfavorable clearance procedures slowing down their activities at the Douala Seaport. One of their major worries concerns the free transit period. Before when the goods arrived, there was two days before they, count, they, they begin to count the, 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 tran the transit time, these 11 days. These 11 days. But now we count it the day that the goods arrive. And this is difficult for us. They are incurring economic loss in time and income because of the obstacles in the clearance chain. If I have my goods arriving in the port of the first of of the fourth first of the month, and then you, uh, 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 administration takes maybe five days to arrange this, manif this uh, the manifest that will permit me to do my declaration and pay custom fees. This is five days 
on uh, 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 the transit, on the transit time, which is 11 days. No, you maybe the five days pass, and then you use maybe four or five days to, to have all the documents. This, this means that you have you, you have what five, five, uh, four or five days, or it remains one day. If you are not able to do this between these five days, uh, uh, remain uh, that remain. This means that they have taken you uh, this five days for nothing, and then this 11 days pass, you are going to pay every day some fees by, uh, uh, because you, you keep your goods in the port. Concerning the specific case of this economic operator, authorities of the Douala port point out several flaws and confusion in his claims. The vessels carrying vehicles and containers they are discharging time as provided by the decree, not even by somebody. Is let us highest 48 hours before, after arriving in the port of Dwar. And then the free time, which is given to every economic operator in the port, is set in a presidential decree of 1985. Uh, would you want to explain to me that because there has been a change in the container yard, that decree has also changed? I don't think. So we should not make confusion is not good. According to the Port Authority, there is no problem of any nature. Maximum disposition has been taken to make sure that everything goes smooth. The Secretary General of the Douala Port Authority adds that despite the adverse impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the maritime transport amenity is functioning in full gear. And for greater details on how the new system put in place at the Douala Seaport after the contract of Bolore Company was terminated, here's an extract of the Secretary General of the Douala Port Authority, Unana Ndo. There is actually not a problem of mastering of the system. There is, uh, the, let me start by the navies. The navy system is the most sophisticated system for the te terminal operations. That is the best terminal operating system used by very big container yards. Prior to the change of uh, end of December, IT personnel were sent in training for about three, four and three months out of this country to master that system. That's why you even realize that the thing was so fast. Only on the 2nd of January, you saw people moving everywhere. Do you think those people could have removed even one container from the yard on the 2nd of, uh, of January if they were no master? No. We don't master such a system within two days. So for that one day is no problem. Now for the CAMSIS, I will remind you that custom, they delayed, they delayed the beginning of the application of CAMSIS from the beginning of the year around April. Do you know why? Because they too, they were making all the tests to make sure that when the thing goes live, they have seen almost everything. Now, as I told you, those systems have to do with a lot of internet. And uh, the, the internet power providers are not here in the port. And they, 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 they can be moments where the, 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 the power of providing will not be at rendezvous. It can happen. So the dispositions which are taken in the point of Dwala to solve those slight problems of transmissions uh, that there is consultation with providers of internet, even right up to the Ministry of Telecommunication to make sure that the port of Dwala and the ports of Cameroon in general 
that is that they are flooded with internet and this is where we put an end to the first part of this newscast talking point is up next The coordinator of the Cameroon Patriotic Diaspora, Dr. Eta Ewan, is joining us from Germany. He welcomes her. Thank you, Mr. Babila. First of all... And it's always a pleasure to be with you. All right. First of all, you are take on the uh, reconstruction plan of the government of Cameroon in the northwest and southwest regions of the country. Uh, I, I think we've had this discussion again, Mr. Babila, and I don't think my stance on this has changed. And I continue to say it is irresponsible on the part of the government to try to embark on reconstruction efforts while the conflict is still ongoing. I think the priority of the government should be to end the conflict before thinking of ever thinking of making any, uh, carrying on any reconstruction at works. I mean, just sending people to do reconstruction in the northwest and southwest is an irresponsible act because you are sending these people on harm's way. I mean, there are still people carrying guns in this region. I mean, the military is still uncontrolled. And I don't see how this kind of reconstruction works will be, can be carried on. I think we, we need to set our priorities right. The government needs to set its priority rights by putting in all necessary efforts to first of all restore peace before ever thinking about reconstructing the regions. I mean, you build today and they destroy today, tomorrow. You build the house and it's burned tomorrow. So that's a, a real waste of uh, people's resources. So I don't think uh, reconstruction is a priority right now. Peace is the top priority and that's what the government should be working for. Uh, those who are managing the construction project, uh, the Minister Delegate at the Ministry of Economic Planning and Regional Development, Paul Tasson, and uh, former Mayor John Donatus are in the northwest uh, region as we speak, and they are on a mission to the two anglophone regions of the country in view of accelerating this plan, the execution, the implementation of this plan in order to reconstruct the destroyed villages and bring back life to uh, the, uh, the, the, the places where uh, the crisis has damaged practically everything. Are you saying that they should stop and go back to Yaoundé? Honestly, I would say yes, they need to stop. They need to stop. I mean, the, the, the efforts they are putting into try to work with more resources, they should rather put these efforts towards uh, restoring peace. And uh, you're talking about Mr. Paul Tasso. <laughs> I think he has to go to the BLM, to his native Le BLM. He, go, he does that under heavy escort. I don't know if the government will be able to provide that kind of security, the security that's provided to Mr. Paul Tasson to workers that will have to carry on the reconstruction works. I know Mr. John uh, Donatos personally, and I'm using this opportunity to send greetings to him because he was for five years my geography teacher in secondary school. And I feel really sorry that he, he's been involved in this kind of mess. So I think, uh, of course, you're doing what you're doing because the government has asked them to do it, but I don't think deeply in them they truly believe that they'll be able to, to carry on such works, especially for some these two guys come from the, some of the most afflicted regions. Mr. Paul Tasson is from the BLM where life has practically stopped. Mr. John Donatos is from Kumbo where things are really tough. I, I remember him reading once that he was kidnapped. And I'm afraid this can happen again. So, I mean, rather than wasting people's time trying to do some of the most irrelevant things, I think the government has to get really more serious now. What we are asking for in the Northwest and the Southwest is peace. People need to put in all the efforts that they can. Peace to return. Reconstruction can be carried on again. I mean, for whom are they trying to reconstruct? For people who are living in the bushes, for people who have fled their villages, these people are out of their native regions. And so the only way you can encourage them to return is to restore peace. If you put on beautiful houses there, construct all sorts of roads that you want to construct, and there is no peace, no one is going to come there. So it will be a real waste of resources. Mm. But uh, the authorities mm. in Yaoundé will respond to you by saying, for example, that 
the uh, while there is uh, effort being put in to restore peace and normals in those two regions, uh, effort should equally be uh, made to reconstruct or bring back life into the destroyed parts of the two Anglophone regions. And uh, the government has been struggling with uh, a, a number of measures uh, being taken uh, resolutions or recommendations of the major national dialogue being implemented, a military crackdown going on to put an end to separatist fighters, and then on the other hand, the reconstruction going on. Uh, I think, Mr. Bavila, uh, uh, peace and reconstruction are both necessary steps. The, the problem here is about the prioritization. What should come first? So you cannot reconstruct where conflict is still ongoing, where bullets are flying. And I'm happy you said the authorities in Yaoundé, they are sitting in Yaoundé in air-conditioned offices, in well-furnished apartments. These people should have the courage to go to some of these regions and see for themselves the damage they have done to the people, the damage they have done to Cameroon. And this is an opportunity for them to correct what the mess that they have created. And rather than putting in real efforts to achieve uh, realizable uh, objectives, they are against pursuing the shadow. You're trying to reconstruct. Reconstruct where? Where there is no life, where there are no people. What people need is peace so they can take control of their lives again. Reconstruction should be a gradual process that can come after or that can begin after the restoration of peace. People are still fighting. I heard you talk about the cut down of uh, military. So where has this taken place? Where is the government withdrawing troops? In which part of Cameroon? Well, uh, uh, southern Cameroons. In which city are they pulling out troops? Now, the government has, uh, I think they have taken the delight of always telling lies and using deceit to misle mislead the Cameroonian people. And it's time to call them to order. Please, they need to work for the restoration of peace. That is the top priority for any reasonable government. You can only reign where there is peace. I mean, a, a government official should be able to go to Lebialem, to go to Bangem, to go to uh, Kumbo, to go to Nso without any military escort, without the heavy escort that we see, heavily armed men. I mean, this is not the Cameroon Mr. Bia inherited. And this is not the Cameroon we expect him to live for the future generations. So he should restore peace. That is the priority. And within the context of the fight against coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, there is an initiative, the, a, a global campaign for peace and justice in the two Anglophone regions of the country launched by over five uh, Nobel Peace Prize uh, laureates, over three uh, former American ambassadors to Cameroon, former uh, Canadian, American, and uh, United Kingdom ministers, and other international uh, dignitaries. What do you think about this campaign? Yeah, Mr. Babila, we've, uh, we've had a very bitter experience over the past four years. And uh, any initiative that is geared towards bringing back peace to the, to the Northwest and Southwest regions should be appreciated. Of course, the global campaign for peace and justice in Cameroon is a laudable initiative that we all as Cameroonians should support, especially uh, given the fact that it is being led by highly respectable uh, personalities, people who have had the opportunity to serve in Cameroon, and who to some extent truly understand the politics and history of Cameroon, and see with the experience that they have, the credibility that they enjoy in the international uh, community can help push uh, the, the peace process forward. The point is, uh, we have, uh, the people of the Northwest and Southwest regions have not seen peace for four years, and the coming of the COVID-19 uh, virus further compounds the, the situation in the Northwest and the Southwest. So every effort needs to be made to stop or to halt or at least alleviate the spread of the virus in the two regions, because if we, we add this to, to the, or the problem that we have, I think we will, we will gradually be leading all the people in the northwest and southwest into their early graves. So this is an initiative that we 
support that we need to encourage. And I think we should believe and trust in the sincerity of the initiators of this peace initiative. I mean, in every country, uh, we need peace, we need justice. These are two key elements that we always need because uh, peace will not reign where there is no justice. And actually, you cannot implement justice or apply justice in an area where there is no peace. But I want to say again, if we have to prioritize the two, because a lot of injustice has been done to the people of the Northwest and Southwest regions. But I think for the sake of peace, we can drop, leave aside justice for now and help restore peace. And when peace has finally settled down, we can embark on uh, applying justice for those who have committed acts of impunity. So I come back to the idea that uh, what we need more now is peace. And if these three initiators are offering, offering us an opportunity to bring back peace apart from to urging, the and southwest regions, I think we all need to support them. Apart from urging the government, the military, and the separatist fighters to uh, put an end to the violence, to... Uh, reach a ceasefire uh, agreement. They are also urging the initiators of that um, uh, campaign, uh, also calling on the United Nations Security Council and the African Union to take action to put an end to uh, the bloodshed and the destruction going on in the northwest and southwest regions of Cameroon. What can these organizations do? I I think the organizations, the two organizations have all the instruments necessary to end violence in the West and Southwest regions. Especially, I don't want to take particularly on the United Nations because, I mean, uh, the African Union is directly concerned with the conflict in the Southern Cameroons. And they have instruments that can permit them to directly intervene. I mean, we looked at the Constitutive Act of the African Union that permits them under certain circumstances to intervene in the internal affairs of member states. I mean, first in the in case of a genocide, illegal overthrow of government, uh, massive abuse of human rights. Now, we can say some of these things already have been happening in the Southern Cameroon for four years. And surprisingly, the African Union has been quiet They've not taken any laudable or meaningful initiative to try to help to mediate between the conflicting parties. So it is time for the African Union to try to cons uh, activate its uh, constitutive act and make some meaningful moves to try to mediate between the conflicting parties or at least to negotiate for a ceasefire while discussions or dialogue is ongoing. So the African Union and the United Nations organization, I mean, well, uh, uh, the, uh, especially the Security Council, we have seen that international interest on the conflict in the southern Cameroon has been really low. I mean, it's been a complete, almost inexistent. And it surprises me because we've seen how fast they have been in intervening in conflicts in other parts of the world. And that's why I come to the conclusion sometimes we are all tempted to agree with the people that African conflicts are African conflicts because we remember quite well after the 1994 massacre in uh, Rwanda, the genocide in Rwanda, the uh, United Nations organization came up with the, when they said, never again. All right. Dr. Ita Iwane, coordinator of the Cameroon Patriotic Diaspora, thanks for joining us today. That's it for this edition of the news. Stay with us.